anticipated blessing to study God's Word with you today. We want to welcome our visitors. We have come on a very special Sabbath. Very, very special Sabbath. Today we have the world famous Seventh day Adventist potluck, known as Haystacks, <laughs> where you can stack the hay on top of the stack or the stack on top of the hay. And we have a little special treat. We serve guacamole with our haystacks. Amen. But I would strongly suggest that you get there soon in line because in this church, people love guacamole. <laughs> and it can only just go so far. This uh, quarter, we're studying the book of Galatians. And today we're studying Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So let's begin by looking at the heading, the heading in your Bible for Galatians chapter 2. And I invite you to read the heading from your Bible for Galatians chapter 2. Defending the Gospel. Defending the Gospel. Any other headings for Galatians chapter 2? Paul explains his Gospel to the Apostles. Paul explains his Gospel to the Apostles. Any other headings? Mine says, the council at Jerusalem. So let's begin by reading verses 1, 2, and 3 of Galatians chapter 2. Do we have a volunteer to read verses 1, 2, and 3 right here? Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. And I went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, lest any means I might run or had run in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Thank you. So the first three verses sets the scene and the theme for chapter 2 of Galatians. Let me read verse 1 again of Galatians chapter 2. Then, after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus also. After 14 years, from what point? From what we learn in Galatians chapter 1, verse 18. Why did Paul go to Jerusalem the first time? And what event had preceded Paul's visit to Jerusalem, recorded in Galatians 1.18? Right, but we've just learned that after 14 years, Paul is impressed to go to Galatians, to, Galatians, to, to Jerusalem. What event took place before these 14 years. And in his first visit, what did that visit come after in Paul's life? His conversion. His conversion. This visit, Paul mentions in verse 1, occurred what? The first visit. 17 years after his second visit to Jerusalem, which roughly was 51 A.D. at this point in time. This visit coincides with the famous Jerusalem Council. Registered, recorded in Acts chapter 15. The Jerusalem Council, which is the heading for Galatians chapter 2. 
we learn from Galatians chapter 1 that converted Jewish Pharisees to Christianity had come to the area in Galatia that Paul had been teaching and they were what? Doing, what were they teaching to the new converts to Christianity? And we learn in chapter 1 that they called it perverting the gospel. In fact, that's the heading for verses, between verses 5 and 6 in Galatians chapter 1. How were they perverting the gospel? that weren't required anymore because Jesus had already died to take away those sacrifices. Very good then. Let's turn to Acts chapter 15 and let's read verse 1. Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Who would like to volunteer to read verse 1 of Acts chapter 15? And then, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This different gospel, which was really, was it really another gospel? No. Is what is being taught to the new converts to Christianity from the Jewish faith and the Gentiles, which we call sometimes Greeks, sometimes we call them heathens. Okay, let's go back to Galatians chapter 1 now, and let's read specifically what Paul is addressing here. Verses 6 and 7 of Galatians chapter 1. Who would like to read verses 6 and 7 of Galatians chapter 1? Patty? I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you how much you pervert the gospel of Christ. Thank you. What was Paul and Barnabas' reaction when they found out what these former Jewish teachers, Pharisees, converted to Christianity we're teaching Paul's new converts. Take a look at Galatians 2, verse 5. Who would like to read Galatians 2, verse 5? Diana? To whom we did not yield to submission even for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Thank you. Was this issue what we would call today a no big deal issue? Hey, we were having a little, you know misunderstanding, we didn't agree, so we decided to uh, agree to disagree, and let's go on to more important topics. Was this that kind of an issue? No. Yeah. Let's find out. Let's turn to the Acts chapter 15, verse 2. Acts chapter 15, verse 2. Who would like to read that for us? When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem and to the apostles and elders about this question. So this was a big deal. This was all about what? The difference between the gospel that Paul had taught them and the counterfeit gospel that converted Pharisees to Christianity were teaching the new believers in the Galatian region. In Acts 14, 26 and 27, Paul and Barnabas have returned from a missionary journey and they are relating to the leaders in Antioch, Antioch, is Antioch in Syria, they're relating to the leaders of the church in Antioch, Syria, 
how God has blessed them. Because they've been out there preaching to whom? The Gentiles. Let me quote it to you, verse, word for word, from Acts of the Apostles, page 188. Paul and Barnabas were sharing all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Open the door of what? What's significant about this? Opening the door of faith to the Gentiles. Do you know that the Gentiles sacrificed to their idols, their gods? Where did they get that idea? From the Old Testament. Is Satan a master of perverting everything that God introduced? And if you don't study and know what's going on, you're going to get deceived. So Paul and Barnabas are introducing what? Faith in what? Animal sacrifices? Right. And so here we have these converted Pharisees to Christianity coming behind Paul and teaching them the what? That they not only need to have the men sacrifice, you know, circumcised, but they what? Continue, have to continue following what? The ceremonial laws that God had introduced in the Old Testament to. That's quite a word, so. 100%. 100%. So, this is a very, very important issue because this church in Antioch, Syria, is probably the largest congregation of new converts to Christianity from the Jewish faith and from the Gentile community. And this is where all of Paul's missionary journeys originated from. So at this time and under these circumstances, this group of converted Jews, Pharisees, to Christianity come and say Paul has only touched a half the gospel course. the men need to be circumcised and all of you need to focus your lives on the ceremonial laws let me read it to you word for word from Acts of the Apostles 189 this, this is what they say Unless one is circumcised according to the custom of Moses and keep the entire ceremonial laws, you cannot be saved. End quote. What would this idea of the new gospel really mean? Some very important words here. 
1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. When you get there, say ready. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus. By whose doing? God. Anywhere in the Bible you find that God asked the Corinthians, or you, or me, permission to put us in Christ? No. So this is something that God did on His own prerogative. And it happened before Paul was converted. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. That's a very important word, the word wisdom. You know how it's spelled in the Hebrew, in the Greek? S-O-P-H-I-A. Sophia. That's where we get the word sophisticated. What kind of wisdom? The sophisticated wisdom of God. Who is supposed to be the wisest man that ever lived on this earth? And how did he experience that wisdom? Did he get on his knees one night and he said his prayers to God and said, Oh, by the way, I want to become the most the, the wisest person that, person that ever lived on this earth. Thank you for answering my prayer. Good night. And the next day he woke up and what? The world began coming to him to ask and see his wisdom and how God was blessed. Is that how it happened? No. no. It is something that we must seek. What do we learn in Matthew 5, verse 6? Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after what? Unless we are hungry and thirsty for something, God is going to say, this person is not really serious. They're just going through prayer motions. But Solomon sought the wisdom of God, and God blessed them. By God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became the most sophisticated wisdom and knowledge possible that a human being can experience in Christ. What else? And righteousness. This is the same word that Jesus used in Matthew 3.15 when he comes to John the Baptist and says, I want for you to baptize me. And what did John say? Whoa! I'm not worthy to carry your sandals and you want me to baptize you? And what did Jesus say? You and I must do this in order that what can be fulfilled? All righteousness. What does that word righteousness mean? It means that Jesus had taken on not only our nature at the Incarnation, but now He was taking on every sin that has ever been committed, past, present, and future. Which the Bible describes as, if the mission was successful, you now have a new title. From Adam and Eve, our great-grandparents, we inherit a title of what? Condemnation. Condemnation. But now Jesus has come, and given us a new title. A title of what? Righteousness. Do you like that? Does that mean you're going to be in heaven? No. It means that you now have a new title. What you choose to do with it is a personal choice between you and God. But what we're reading here in 1 Corinthians 1.30 is that by God's doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and what's the next word? Sanctification. What is sanctification? It comes from a Hebrew word, hagion, hagion. 
speaking of the most holy place. Same word, hagia. It means that God is what? <clears throat> Sanctified you in whom? Christ. In Christ. Does that mean that you're going to experience it? That depends on your choice. <clears throat> Question. It also means uh, set apart for a holy use. Yes. And that's what we are. We're, when we give our lives to Christ, we're not just not now on our own. We actually serve God now. We're set apart for a holy use. Beautiful thought. Do we feel set apart? Uh, we need to uh, uh, look back at uh, what the Pharisees that believe that's what Acts 15 is talking about. They weren't just talking out of the air. They actually had scriptures, plain scriptures about circumcision. And so it wasn't a, a slam dunk that the, the Christians of that era could just simply blow this off and say, well, that's works, you know. And so uh, we're not saved by works, brother. We're saved by grace through faith, you know. Uh, they weren't able to do it that easy because the Pharisees that believed had scriptures like this one in Genesis chapter 17 where it says that Abraham uh, was told by God to perform the rite of circumcision. We're going to come to that. Okay. Thank you. And so those are those are plain scriptures that God commanded the children of Israel to perform. So Thank it you. wasn't that easy just to duck out of this. So we need to respect that as we as we're looking at this. So wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and what's the last thing? Redemption. What does that mean? Redemption. Redeemed from what? We also looked a couple of weeks ago at another scripture similar to what written by the same person, Paul, that wrote 1 Corinthians 1.30. We looked at Romans 5. 10 and 11. Let's go to the left here from 1 Corinthians. Take a look at Romans 5, 10 and 11. When you're there, say ready. I will read. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life. Again, something has happened to the we here. While we were what? Enemies. What do enemies do to each other? Right? They try to kill each other. So, under that mindset, Christ has done what? He has reconciled us. The word reconciled in Greek is katalasos, which means, and look it up in your concordance, it means restored to the divine favor. Do you like that? In other words, after what Christ has done in us, we now stand before God, as Adam and Eve did, before they sinned. Which means that it's impossible for you to be lost because of what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. You can still be lost, but you must bring that condemnation on yourself by doing it rejected. What we're studying here. So if your loss is because you chose to be lost, you cannot be lost because of what Adam and Eve did. Verse 11. And not only this, Romans 5, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. How do we experience reconciliation? Through whom? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. What was biblically wrong with what these biblical scholars were teaching the new converts to Christianity in Galatia? 
What was wrong with it? It was a direct attack on the gospel that Paul had taught these people and a clear denial of the power of Christ to save. They were being taught that what Christ had done was what? Not enough. I'm going to keep repeating that because we today, with all of our knowledge, all of our education, all of our degrees, all of our titles, feel very, very comfortable in introducing our personal opinions and speculations about the scriptures. Did Paul immediately recognize the danger of what was being taught to these new converts to Christianity? Who would like to read Galatians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5? Galatians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Volunteer? Over here. And this occurred because a false brother secretly brought in and came by stealth to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Thank you. In chapter 1 of Galatians, how did Paul describe these false brethren and what they were doing? And how should they be dealt with? Let's go back a couple of weeks to Galatians chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 9. Who would like to read that? Ricky? Galatians chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 9. Which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to prefer the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preach any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. What does the word accursed mean in the Greek? How does it spell? The dedicated to evil. Right. And the solution from the concordance for anathema is what? Banned. These people should be banned. They should be excommunicated. That's Paul's inspired solution. Is that too rough? How should we deal with this today? Or do we have this problem today? Yes. Question. Uh, but I think we should be careful. Uh, let's make sure we're on board with Paul before we start banning people. Because it could be that we got the works thing figured out, but we're not really clear on what Paul is talking about when he's talking about this reconciliation, or when he says we're we're saved by his death, but much more by his life. What does Paul mean about that? Well, we're going to get into that. Okay, I hear you, but I'm just saying uh, the banning thing. Uh, we just need to hold off on that until we're on board with Paul, because we might not be on board with Paul. On, on the idea of what, what Christ has accomplished and what he gave to us in his doing and that. In 2014, my wife and I visited a church in Central California Conference, and I, we didn't know that we, we didn't think that we knew anyone there. But uh, we found out it was a Hispanic and an Anglo church. And after Sabbath school, we went and sat down and got ready for the church service. And the first elder had heard a tape of mine in Spanish. And he said to me, we did not have the regular speaker to show up for our service. So I called them. And they said, oh, I forgot that today was the Sabbath I was supposed to be there. He forgot. So he comes up to me and he says, 
five minutes before the 11 o'clock service, would you be willing to preach? And my wife wrote, hmm? and I said, well, I submitted a quick prayer and said, God said, do it. I did. <clears throat> After the service, they had a potluck. And my wife and I were invited. We stayed. We enjoyed it. And then the first elder of the anchor.